tonight. Psalm chapter 3 this evening is a wonderful chapter in the Word of God. And I would uh, ask you to do something for me before we ever start. There's something I don't want you to forget as we preach through the text tonight. And we'll constantly be reminding you of this, but I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you to forget where David is and what is going on in David's life at the point in time when he writes this psalm. Most of your psalms have a little heading over the top that gives you an insight into what the writer is going through in his life, where he's at at this particular point in his, in his walk with God when he writes what he's about to give us. Now, if you've got the heading above there, you'll read it with me. If not, then just listen to me read it. Psalm chapter 3, it says, is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. You know what a psalm is? It's going to be a song. I find that God many times brings out the most beautiful music in our deepest miseries. How in the world is a man going to write a song and sing to the glory of God when his own son is literally... Not, not there's a rift in the family, y'all. Not Absalom didn't come over for Thanksgiving dinner. Not, 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 not they have just gotten a little bit sideways at each other. His boy has run him out of the kingdom and is hunting his daddy like an animal trying to kill him tonight. You think you got family problems. <laughs> Let me say this. You sit here tonight and say, well, God can't use my family because we're dysfunctional. I don't hardly find any families in the body in the Bible that God used that wasn't highly dysfunctional. God specializes in taking our dysfunction and turning them into a function for His glory and His honor tonight. And so we, we get this in our mind, and we in chapter 3, verse 1, David says, Lord. That's a real good way to start out when you're in a mess like David's in. <laughs> when you got problems as big as David's got, David doesn't say, preacher. David doesn't say, priest. David doesn't say, brother, daddy, sister, mama. <laughs> David says, there's only one person that can help me in the mess I'm in. Lord. And I'm glad the Lord is available uh, when we don't know who to turn to. And not just when we don't know who to turn to, but when we can't turn to anybody else. You realize there's some things sometimes in life that are of such a personal nature, that are of such a, a, a dark nature that you just can't share them with everybody. You, 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 you can't call somebody and tell them about it and you wouldn't want them to know even if you could but I'm glad there is somebody that is listening and somebody that wants to hear and morning, noon or night you can present your burdens and your requests and petitions to the Lord you might wake up at 2.30 in the morning and the burden's over your head and you say man I'd like to talk to brother so and so but I sure would hate to wake him up right now and I feel bad about calling him at this hour of the night but I'm glad you say how do you know this is true because I'm preaching what I've lived before I'm glad there are times when you roll out of bed in the late night hour and the Lord doesn't say hey it's too late or too early to talk to me or talk to my secretary or talk to an angel or talk to a cherubim or got God's voicemail I'm glad he's always on the line and he's always listening David says, Lord, I got to hurry. We'll never get through this thing. How are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be would say of my soul, there's no help for him in God, say law. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, say law. I laid me down and slept. I wait for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me 
round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. There's a word that's in this chapter that I want to lift out in just a minute and, and really put it in your heart, and I don't want you to forget it later on as we preach this message, but let me just preach down to the word. The first thing we find about this text is we find there's an increase of trouble in David's life. There's an increase of trouble, Brother Lancaster, in David's life. Here David says this in verse number 1, and even though there's no question mark in verse 1, it almost is posed like a question. He asks the Lord, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many there be that rise up, or many are they that rise up against me. He's almost asking the Lord, Lord, how has this happened? Lord, it seems like just yesterday I was sitting in the palace. Everything was good. Uh, I, I, I was prosperous. I was happy. All was well. And then it seemed like overnight my world has turned upside down. Lord, how has this happened this fast? It seemed like yesterday I had no enemies. And now my friends, my family, they've all turned against me. Many in the kingdom that just yesterday if I would have walked by them, they would have smiled at me and said, good to see you King David and bowed their head at me now they literally took up arms against me and they're trying to kill me David says how has this happened and can I say that's the way trouble works in life uh, I've never found uh, brother Christian that trouble has ever texted me a day before it comes and lets me know go ahead and get ready about this time tomorrow you're going to have some serious trouble <laughs> You know, I, I've never found that I get a letter in the mail from trouble and saying, hey, on this month and this date, you know, a little ways out, just go ahead and prepare yourself. Trouble's coming. You're going to get the long face from the doctor. You're going to have trouble in your home. You, you, you're going to end up, you know, with some problem in your life. Your children are going to go crazy. I ain't never found that's the way it is. I find you go to sleep one night and you wake up the next morning and bam. I mean, just there it is. You say, how has this happened? How has it gone from sitting on the pew worshiping in God with my family to now it seems like it's busting at the seams. How has it gone from everything good in my life, tranquil in my life, to now tragedy in my life? Uh, and you all realize tonight life can change in one phone call. Life can change in one doctor visit. Life can change in one conversation with a loved one or with a friend that you never saw something coming down the pike and bam, there it is. Life can change like that with your children and I know we all think tonight uh, that, that our children, we raise them in church and we pray over them and we think our children won't never turn out wrong. But the fact is I've watched many of God's people that pray over their babies and raise them in church and all of a sudden they absolutely go nuts and go haywire. And overnight it seems like my youngins was little and they were singing in the choir, singing in the church and going to Sunday school. Now I've turned around and they're grown and they're stepping all over my heart and breaking my heart into pieces. Lord, how has this trouble increased in my life? Fine, there's an increase of trouble. But then we see also, along with the increase of trouble, there comes the irritation from his tormentors. Watch this. The devil is never satisfied to leave well enough alone. And when you're having trouble, I find this, I find this. It seems like the devil, Brother Foster, is almost like a boogeyman when everything's going good. You know what I mean? He's like some figment of our imagination we just preach on. But I'm going to tell you when you really find the devil to be a serious adversary and a serious foe is when you have an increase of trouble, you'll find the devil will show up with the trouble. What does he do? He does what happened to David in verse 2. Watch the irritation from his tormentors. Many there be that which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. David is laying down and he's hearing that not just the still small voice of the Lord. Can I say there's another still small voice sometimes that comes along and it ain't just the voice of the Lord. Along with that voice, Brother Sammy, sometimes comes the voice of the tempter. Sometimes comes the voice of the one that hates our soul and he'll lean over in your ear and say, if God loved you, he wouldn't be letting this happen to you. Where is your God now? 
God is all through with you. There's no help for you in God. You might as well not go back to church. You might as well not pick up your Bible. You might as well not pray anymore. You might as well turn that gospel CD off and go back to listen to ACDC and Leonard Skinner. You might as well just forget about all this because God ain't been fair and God ain't been good and God has walked off in your darkest hour right when you needed him the most. You all washed up and you all done. Now anybody that's lived for God more than about five minutes can testify to the fact you've heard that voice before. I know I have. Brother Phil, there's been times in my life where the devil has come along when trouble has increased and said, Zorn, just throw the towel in. When my little boy got cancer at four years old and me and my wife sitting in the dark at the hospital and everything flipped upside down just like that, gone from preaching meeting one day uh, to sitting in the cancer ward the next day uh, and looking at chemo and surgery and all the possibilities that comes with it. I'm going to tell you there was a voice not just from heaven. There was a voice that come from hell saying, where's your God at now, preacher? Uh, where's grace at now, preacher? Uh, uh, where's mercy at now, preacher? Uh, hey, sing a song now, preacher. God's all done with you. We find the increase of trouble and the irritation from his tormentors, but thank God we find the inspiration for the tried, the troubled, and the tormented. Watch the inspiration. I'm glad it don't end in verse 2. Verse 3, but thou. Watch this. This is highly inspirational. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. My glory. And, and, and you're the one that lifts my head up and says, pick your chin up. The lifter of my went when my head's bowed down and I, and I got my head down. I think there ain't no way I can go on. God's the one that leaches down through preaching or singing or through his word and his spirit and lifts my chin up and says, pick your head up, honey. Pick your head up, sister. Pick your head up, brother. There's a brighter day coming. It'll be all right. I ain't died yesterday. I'm still on the throne. I'm still ruling and reigning. It's not going to be dark forever. The sun will shine again. Lift your head up. It's going to be all right. He said he cried unto the Lord and he heard me out of his holy hill. Now watch verse 5. I want you to notice this. Here's our inspiration tonight. Watch verse 5. I laid me down and slept. Man, that's peace, Brother Jordan. I want y'all to understand where he's laying down at. Y'all, we, we read that and we think, well, he crawled into bed and he went to sleep. No, he's run out of his kingdom. We'll, we'll find in First Sarah and Second Samuel in a little bit. You know where he's laying down at? In the wilderness. He's sleeping not in the feather tick bed of the king's palace curled up with his my pillow and the fan blowing to give him some white noise and the covers snuggled up and guards around his bed tonight but David brother Ray is sleeping out under the stars the dew is wetting him at night he's got a stone for his pillow he ain't sleeping in the peace of the palace he's sleeping out in the woods and yet he said even in that place even in that place God I'm telling you you can lay down and sleep if God's on your side tonight now I want you to notice what it said. Watch this. Don't miss this. I thought this was amazing in my King James Bible. Verse 5. I laid me down and slept. Watch what's in between the two semicolons. I wait. Duh. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what you do after you go to sleep. You wake up. There's all kind of people that go to sleep in the Bible and they don't tell us they wake up. We just know they did. Why does David include, Preacher Foster, that he went to sleep and he woke up? I'll tell you why. David was in such a dark night in his life, he didn't expect to wake up. David is in such a bad spot, 
He thinks any minute while I'm sleeping, one of my son's mercenaries is going to slip up on me and cut my throat while I'm sleeping. Any minute while I'm sleeping, they're going to draw a bow back and nail me to the ground or take a spear and jab me to the ground. But he says, what do you know? I went to sleep and I heard the birds singing the next morning. I, I, I seen the sun shine the next morning. I, I smelled the cook fire burn and the next morning you say how in the world did David make it through the dark night how in the world has David made it through a, a sleepless night a dark night a hard night here's the word here's why he made it through watch what he says in verse 5 I laid me down and slept I waked for this is the reason why how did you make it David did you make it cause you're a great warrior did you make it cause you killed a giant did you make it cause you're a wonderful king did you make it cause you're a psalmist he says no there's one reason and one reason only why I made it through the dark night why I live to tell about it for the Lord hears our word tonight sustained me. He said the only reason I made it is there was a God sustaining me tonight. And can I just take a time out and give personal testimony and say there's been some dark nights in my life that the devil said you won't make it through this one. There's some dark nights in my life that the devil said you won't make it out of this one. You won't preach again. You won't worship again. You won't sing again. But somehow I live to see the birds sing and the sun shine and live to see God still good. You say, preacher, how'd you make it through? Is it because you're a great Christian? Absolutely not. I'm a sorry Christian. You say, is it because you're a preacher? Absolutely not. I'm a poor excuse of one. You say, how did you make it through? There was a God sustaining me. There was a God in the dark night. There was a God that was helping me when I couldn't help myself and sustain me through it tonight. I love the word sustained. The word sustained is many faceted, multifaceted, and you can just pick any of the explanations and use them tonight in the context of the message. The word sustain means to support. It means to hold up. I like this. The word means to endure without giving way. In other words, y'all know what that pulpit's doing for me right now? It's holding me up. It's enduring without giving way. It's supporting me. It's supplying my need. You yank that pulpit out from under me, and I'm going to fall face first into the communion table and bust my nose in front of everybody. And the only reason why I'm still standing right now is something is strong enough to hold me up. Something is supporting me. Something is enduring without giving way. And y'all, hey, you say, preacher, how in the world uh, are we still standing in this Christian life? It ain't because of you. Uh, it's because we're leaning on them everlasting arms. Uh, we're leaning on somebody that he's enduring without giving way. He's supporting us. He's supplying for us. He's holding us up tonight. <laughs> I like what old David says here in the next verse. Watch what he says after he said the Lord sustained him. He said, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. He says, I tell you what, not only can I go to sleep and not worry about it because he's sustaining me, I can walk out onto the battlefield surrounded by enemies all around and not worry about going down because somebody's supporting me even in the hottest part of my battle. I don't know how hot your battle is tonight, but I know you got somebody on your side that the Bible calls a man of war. You got somebody on your side that is called the captain of our salvation. You got somebody on your side that David said, he teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. You got a real warrior on your side. And I want to use this word just for a few minutes tonight. I'm going to keep you long. I'm going to use this word just for a few minutes tonight and preach on the word sustained. Sustained. It's a great word. 
I told you it's multifaceted. It means a lot to a lot of different people. Can I show you three individuals that the word sustained means a lot to tonight? Number one, the word sustained means a lot, firstly, to a man in a courtroom. <laughs> it means a lot to a man in a courtroom. Say, so what do you mean a man in a courtroom? We all know what a courtroom scene looks like. You, you, you have a judge that sits on the bench presiding over the courtroom. You have a prosecutor that he is trying to execute judgment and prosecute someone for crimes they may or may not have committed. You have the accused, the one who has been accused of the crime, but in the accused corner you have uh, the defense attorney, someone who stands as representation for the one who is being accused and reasons his case to the judge. Now I want y'all to know something. This word sustained is a blessing in the courtroom. Now y'all listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I don't want y'all to miss this before I move on any farther in this point. The word sustained can only be used by one person in the courtroom and it mean anything. There's only one person that can use it and it have any authority. And that's the one that runs the courtroom. It's the one that sits on the bench and is running the courtroom. He's the only one that can use it and it be legitimate. You say, preacher, that all sounds real nice, but that ain't got nothing to do with us tonight. I mean, I, I, I ain't involved in no courtroom scene. This ain't got nothing to do with me. I, I beg to differ. Do you realize there's one of these going on, a courtroom scene going on in heaven tonight? Say, I don't believe it. Prove it to me gladly. The Bible said that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible said he accuses us to the Lord. Before you ever got up this morning, there was an adversary of your soul that was already bringing out a litany list of all your sins and all of your shortcomings and trying to get God to absolutely cut you out the family and pitch you off on your head into hell or absolutely judge you in the worst of ways in your flesh for things you would, that you've done that nobody else even maybe knows about. But there is somebody on the other side. And on the other side, there is a defense attorney. There is somebody that is pleading my case. You say, who is that? That Bible said there is one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. The Bible said he is the daysman betwixt God and man, the book of Job. The Bible said we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world and then on the throne eternal is the father himself he is the one that is running up the show tonight you say what's that got to do with anything well uh, that accuser begins to accuse me to the father and say let me tell you something Cody's on and everything he's cracked up to be I know him like don't nobody else know him I mean I know his darkest secrets I, I, I mean I, I, I know the real him. Not to him that the church knows. Uh, not to him that his family knows. Uh, I mean the real him. And let me say this. He knows you too. Right. Yeah. You might as well just take your halo off tonight because it's cocked sideways on your horns anyways. You might as well just act like you, you got problems like everybody else in the building's got tonight. Brother, can I say that old accuser, the things he accuses, he's right to say it. But thank God in the midst of all that accusation, uh, my defense attorney, my lawyer, my advocate, he stands up and says, Father, I object. And the Father says, on what grounds do you object? And my advocate says, 
I got five wounds that I bear, one in each of my feet, one in each of my hands, and a hole in my side, and that proves I died for them sins. I paid for them sins. I rose again for that young end, uh, and I shed my blood, uh, and I made propitiation for him. Uh, I've settled it all. You say, what happens then? <laughs> I got to think the Father says, sustained. I support that. I uphold that. I agree with that. Case dismissed. Toss it out of court. That's one of my youngins. Bought and paid for with the blood of my only begotten son. I sustain it tonight. Aren't you glad there is someone up yonder sustaining our standing in himself? That's what David's going through. The accuser is pointing. The accuser is accusing. The accuser is saying God's through with you. But yet David stands up and says, Oh no, he's sustaining me. The Lord is sustaining my cause. The Lord is sustaining my position. The Lord is upholding me tonight. I like them Lester Roloff songs. Y'all got me all tore up crying over there listening to it. I grew up on that stuff. Brother Lester sung this too. Looking down through the ages, God beheld a dying soul. No, that's not what he said. Yeah, it is. No, it ain't. I'm thinking of a different song. What's that song about the stain? I sung that the other night. Deeper than the stain had gone. How does that song go? Lester sung it. Man, it got me all up in my feels the other day singing about it. Dark the stain. There it is. Stand up and sing it for us, friend. Who said that? Stand up and sing it. We'll shout with you. Sing it. Listen. <laughs> this is the part. purifies our souls and we're going to get it together deeper than the stain has gone. Aren't you glad the stain of the blood goes deeper than the stain of sin tonight? Thank God it means something to the man in the courtroom. Sustain. Sustain. It don't just mean something to the man in the courtroom. Let me move on and say this. It means something to the musician's calling. It means something to the musician's calling. It's, this word sustained is vital to music. Without this word and without the ability of this word, musicians could not do what they do. Well, R.C., I, I called a friend of mine when I was pondering this message and put it together, and he's an accomplished pianist, bass player, plays a bunch of different instruments and goes all over the country doing so in churches. Brother Jordan, I called him and I said, I said, Brother, I want to ask you a question. I said, I ain't baiting you. I just want to know an answer. In your estimation, in, in your estimation, what does the word sustain mean to you in, in music? What, what does it mean to you? And this is what he told me. Don't miss this. This is what he told me. He said, it is the glue that holds all the notes together. That if it was not for the sustain, the music would fall apart. But what holds the music together without it chopping up is the ability to sustain it. Now, I'm no musician, but I know, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I got this much down. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? How you turn this booger on? There we go. I just turned it on. Give me some volume on that thing. Crank her up, praise God. Turn it up, amen. I got this much knowledge. I know them three pedals down there that ain't the clutch and the brake and the gas. <laughs> I know this. Now, don't get, you, don't get your hopes up. Ain't nothing great fixing to happen here, all right? I know that this right pedal is what they call the sustain. And I know if I hit these keys like this without the sustain... That's all you're going to get. It ain't going to be much. But I know if I hold that sustain pedal down, it'll... It's still going. It's still going. It's still going. 
It just stopped because I let go of the sustain pedal. Do you hear the difference in and how choppy that is too? Say, preacher, what makes the difference in the music? What keeps the music going on instead of stopping? And the only reason is the sustain is what keeps it going on. And can I tell you, when you read about this story right here, this is one of the greatest singers in the Bible. And there is no earthly reason why that guy ought to be singing a song in the midst of a mess like he's going through. What is keeping the music flowing through this guy's life? Somebody's sustaining. Somebody, some of y'all come into church and y'all rear back and go to singing, leaning on the everlasting arms, get to singing them good songs about more about Jesus. And, and you're going through hell by the half acre and the devil stands on the other side side and says how in the world can they be singing how in the world can they be joyful that should have wiped the music out of them that should have stopped the song in their heart but yet in the morning they're singing throughout the day they're singing in the night they're singing at church what is that God put something on the inside of us when he saved us and it keeps the music going it's the sustain in our life brother most of all our great hymns was written out of dark tragedies where the music should have been severed but yet it kept going on when the devil tried to stop the music but God kept sustaining that individual Luther, Luther Bridgers was a great preacher of yesteryear and Luther Bridgers uh, preached in the late 1800s and early 1900s he was away from his home his wife and about four children and while he was away at that meeting he got a telegram that said uh, that the house they were staying in with a family caught on fire and all of his children died and not one or two, all of them. And they said he got back home and buried all four of them babies and was left just him and his wife. And it was some time after that, old Luther Bridger sat down and wrote this. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and woe. Fear not, I'm with thee. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know fills my every longing in my heart. Keeps me singing as I go. One of them verses said, though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, I see his footprints all the way. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I imagine the devil sat back and thought, hey, there's four wooden crosses. There's four little graves. And yet that fellow's still singing. How's that possible? Something is sustaining him. You heard about her AC Spafford the other night it is well with my soul after his children died Joseph Scriven was uh, engaged to be married uh, to the love of his wife and the day before their wedding uh, she was kicked off a horse and drowned in a river and Joseph Scriven after that heartbreaking experience uh, wrote the words what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer Sister Fanny Crosby, blind from birth, uh, never saw the light of day or the face of her loved ones. Uh, and she said, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Say, what is this, preacher? This is God sustaining us. It's a blessing to the musicians calling. It's a blessing to the man in the courtroom. Lastly, I'll give you this and I'm done. It's a blessing to a massive burden carrier. It's a blessing to a massive burden carrier. Would you look at one, another text of Scripture with me? Would you, would you move from Psalm 3 and go to Psalm 55? Now, Psalm 55 is a psalm of David, but it doesn't tell us what's going on in his life when he wrote it. But there is no doubt when you read it, it is from the same time as Psalm 3. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because he says things like in verse number 12 about his friend reproaching him. His own acquaintance in verse 13 and 14 that they took counsel together and walked to the house of God, but now he's turned on him. That is Ahithophel. That's his counselor Ahithophel in 2 Samuel that we read about later on that done him wrong when Absalom took the throne. This is the same exact time. That he's writing this psalm. And I want you to notice, there's only two times in David's life where he uses the word sustain, and they're both in the same tragedy. 
There's something about this word that David loves. Verse 22, Psalm 55, 22. Talk about the massive burden carrier. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous. You see what David says? David said, if you'll chunk your burden on the Lord, the Lord will hold you up. He'll support you. He'll sustain you. I think the reason why a lot of people don't see as much of the sustaining ability of the Lord as they like is the Lord says, you give me your burden, I'll give you my sustain. No, Lord, I'm going to carry it. Well, you're going to wear yourself out. You can't do it. You say, preacher, does David cast his burden on the Lord while he is running from Absalom? Absolutely. One more text and we're done. Second Samuel. Let's go look at it ourselves. Look at where he's running from Absalom. Second Samuel chapter 15. Watch 2 Samuel 15. This is where he's running from Absalom. This was our text. Psalm 3 and Psalm 55. This is what David's talking about. He's running from Absalom. Watch 2 Samuel 15 and verse number 30. 2 Samuel 15, 30. And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up, had his head covered. He went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head. And they went up weeping as they went up. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, Oh, Lord, I pray thee turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now watch it. I mean, he's carrying a burden, y'all. Weeping, crying, head down. Verse 32. Where is he going to cast his burden on the Lord at? Verse 32. Check it out, check it out. And it came to pass when David was come to the top of the mount. Watch the next few words. Where he what in the middle of his boy trying to kill him David worshipped God you say preacher worshiping God ain't going to help me in the midst of me carrying a big burden oh yes it will worship will help a whole lot because worship is God I'm giving it to you See, can I just can I go off on a little tangent here for just a minute? Can I just go off on something that bothers me in our modern day churches, a lot of modern day churches now? This ain't worship, y'all. This ain't worship. You say, what is this? Well, if I walk up to you and do this, that means I want something. You mean? Modern day worship is give me something. Give me, give me, give me, give me something. But Bible worship ain't God. Give me something. Bible worship is God. I give you something. See, Bible worship's like this. This man knows what this means. This means I get up. I'm giving you me. I get up. Yeah. Worship is God, I'm giving you something. What's David doing at the top of the hill? He's giving God his burden. God, I can't do nothing with this. God, I can't handle this. God, I can't change my boy's heart. God, I can't change his situation. So I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to cast my burden on the Lord. You say, okay, so he cast his burden. Does God sustain him? Yeah. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Watch God sustain him. I love this. Chapter 16, verse 1. David has worshipped God. Chapter 16, verse 1. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them 200 loaves of bread, and a 100 bunches of raisins, and a 100 of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine and the such as be faint in the wilderness may drink you say what's going on here don't miss this y'all I want you to see this and we're done we're done I'm shut my Bible I don't mean nothing but I'm just showing it to you uh, I want you to see this David's coming up this side of the mountain and you say what's David doing he's doing only what he can do and that's worshiping he's worshiping God but little does David know while he's worshiping on this side that God's working something out on that side 
See, listen to me. David can't, y'all don't miss this. David can't do nothing about what God's doing over there, but he can do something about what he's supposed to do here. Y'all listen to me. You can't do nothing about what God's doing on his side of the hill, but you can dead level sure do what you're supposed to do on your side of the hill. And if you'll do what you're supposed to do on your side of the hill, God will be doing something on his side of the hill. And when you get to the place, God will sustain you tonight. You, 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 keep, you keep on trying to see the problem with a lot of Christians is here's our side of the hill and we doing what we're supposed to do. Instead, we want to run over here on God's side and say, now God, I want you to do this, 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 and this, and this. So it's just like this, 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 and this when I get there, all right? All right, you make sure it's just like that now. All right, I want you to, won't you leave God alone on his side of the hill? It'll be better than what you could do. You on your side, you just cast your burden on the Lord and worship him and walk by faith and trust that when you get to the place where God knows you need it the most, God will send the sustenance and the sustain that you so desperately need. Cast it on the Lord and he'll sustain you. Lancaster family, would you help me up here? Maybe tonight you walked in and you've been accused by the devil. Your music has about stopped. Your burden is so heavy you about can't carry it no more. And the devil's chirping in your ear saying, there's no help for you in God. You were stupid for even going to revival. It's not going to change anything. Oh, tonight, maybe you come and say, Lord, I'm just going to worship you and give you my burden, and I'm going to trust you will sustain me. I'm going to go home and lay down and sleep, and I'm going to wake up to another day and watch God sustain again. God provide and deliver again. Thank God for a Lord and a Savior that sustains us. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray you'd take these few scattered and feeble words that was preached by this preacher and somehow you'd use it to be a blessing to somebody. God, you know my sole motive and goal tonight was to try and be a blessing. God, I pray you'd take these five loaves and two fishes and make them go farther than I can. God, help somebody with it. Some Christian in here, Lord, that they, they, Lord, they just, they just carrying such heavy loads, Lord, that they can't even share it with people like they'd like to. I pray they'd share it with you again, and you'd share your ability to sustain them one more time. In Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons, and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.